on Rachel Polin to talk. Uh, Rachel's son is held captive by Hamas. My name is Rachel, and I am the mother of Hirsch Goldberg Polin. He's my eldest child and my only son. The last time I saw Hirsch was on Friday night, October 6th. We are Americans and Israeli, and we live in Jerusalem with Hirsch and our two daughters. We had gone to, as a family to synagogue and then to dinner at our friend's house. And at 11 p.m., Hirsch took his backpack he had brought with him, kissed me and kissed John, and headed out to meet one of his childhood friends whose name was Honor. And they were going to go to an all-night nature music festival in the south of Israel, ironically called the Festival of Unity and Love. The next morning, I was having a cup of tea when the bomb sirens started to blare in Jerusalem. John had already left for synagogue. I quickly woke my two daughters, and we went into our bomb shelter in our apartment. After 10 minutes, we came out, and although normally I don't use my phone on the Jewish Sabbath, because it was an emergency, I turned on my phone to make sure that Hirsch and Honor were okay. That was at 8.20 Saturday morning. Immediately, two texts popped up on my screen from 8.11. The first text said, I love you. And the second said, I'm sorry. And I immediately knew something horrible was unfolding in my world. We came to find out what happened. When the massacre that ultimately killed close to 300 at that music festival and more than 1,400 people total, when that massacre began, Hirsch, Honor, and 27 others managed to escape to a roadside bomb shelter and hid inside. Hamas militants came to the doorway and began throwing in hand grenades, which all witnesses with whom we have spoken said that Honor managed to pick up eight of them and throw them back out. But three of those hand grenades did get by and detonated inside. Next, Hamas fired into this small concrete room of 29 music lovers, an RPG, and then sprayed the room with machine gun fire. After a couple of moments of the dust settling, Hamas entered. Most of those young people were now dead. Some were alive and wounded and trapped under the dead bodies, so they pretended to be dead. It is from those witnesses that we know that Hirsch and two other young men were ordered to stand, and when Hirsch stood up, they all saw that his left arm had been blown off from the elbow. He had somehow managed to put on some sort of tourniquet or bandage and walked out with the other two young men. They were loaded onto a Hamas pickup truck and headed toward Gaza. Hirsch's last cell phone signal was found inside of Gaza at 10.25 in the morning on October, October 7th. And since then, we have been given a video showing Hirsch getting into that truck with a bloody stump where his left arm used to be. And that was 18 days ago. And since then, we know nothing. We have begged the Red Cross from all and all other international humanitarian aid organizations to find out if the hostages, who are from 33 different countries around the world, who were severely wounded like Hirsch, were they treated? The grandmothers, the babies, or 17-year-old Ruth Perez, who has mitonic dystrophy and was stolen from her wheelchair from the music festival without her feeding tube. But our pleas came to no avail. The Red Cross said they were at the border, but they were denied access into Gaza. So here I live in a different universe than all of you. You are right there. We seem like we live in the same place, but I, like all of the mothers and all of the fathers and wives and husbands and children and brothers and sisters and loved ones of the stolen, we all actually live on a different planet. And the very cruelest of questions each of us is asked every single day without intended malice is, how are you? Well, picture your own mother and then picture her being told there are only two options. You are either dead or you had your arm blown off and were kidnapped by gunpoint into Gaza and no one knows where you are or if you bled to death in that pickup truck 18 days ago or if you died yesterday or if you died five minutes ago. Picture your own mother and that those are her only two options. And that is my answer to you when you ask, how are you? That is how all of us here on our planet feel this planet of beyond pain, 
our planet of no sleep, our planet of despair, our planet of tears. There are over 200 hostages being held in Gaza right now. Over 100 of them are from 33 countries. Where is the world? We, the families of the 200 hostages, are far away on our own planet of agony. But where are you? Why is no one crying out for these people to be allowed access to the Red Cross? Why is no one demanding just proof of life? This is a global humanitarian catastrophe. And the hatred being showered on Israel now, I keep being asked by that in all of the press, and I will say two things. First, in an article I read, it was so eloquently stated that when you only get outraged when one side's babies are killed, then your moral compass is broken and your humanity is broken. And therefore, in your quiet moments alone, all of us everywhere on planet Earth need to really ask ourselves, do I aspire to be human or am I swept up in the enticing and delicious world of hatred? This is not a phenomenon unique to Israel or Gaza. This is everywhere on our planet. I understand that hatred of the other, whoever we decide that other is, is seductive, sensuous, and most importantly, it's easy. Hatred is easy. But hatred is not actually helpful, nor is it constructive. Second, I know that Israel is being cautious, not just because Israel knows there are 200 hostages who were stolen into Gaza on October 7th but also because Israel knows there are two million Palestinian civilians who are trapped in Gaza. And this is why Israel gives warnings to civilians in Gaza to relocate before they strike. But there were no warnings given to the women, the children, the elderly, the music lovers, and the babies on October 7th before the intentional massacres on innocent lives. We all know that war and conflict always, always ends up hurting the innocent and that is why war is so brutal and it is why it's so very devastating. We see that everywhere in our world and everywhere in the history of our world. And a competition of pain, there is never a winner. One thing gave me a whisper of hope from all of the horror on October 7th because one of the witnesses with whom I spoke told me that when the rocket fire first began and all of those young music-loving hippies went running into the bomb shelter, there was a Bedouin man who was a guard at the kibbutz across the street and he ran into that same shelter for cover. And as Hamas closed in on the bomb shelter, the man told the young people, shh, stay quiet, let me go talk to them. And he went outside and he said in Arabic, I'm a Muslim, everyone inside is my family, we are Muslim, you don't have to search in there. He tried to save them. He could have just said, I'm a Muslim and just saved himself. But he tried to do the right thing even though it was terrifying and even though it required unimaginable courage. He was brutally beaten and the witnesses do not know what his fate was. But I take comfort, comfort for a fleeting moment knowing that there was someone trying to do the right thing when everything in the universe had been turned upside down. We human beings have been blessed with the gifts of intellect, creativity, insight, and perception. Why are we not using it to solve global conflicts all over the world? Because doing this is hard, and it takes fortitude, imagination, grit, risk, and hope. So instead, we opt for hatred, because hatred is so comfortable, so familiar, and so very, very easy. I implore world leaders, both seen and unseen, who have been working tirelessly to get all the hostages free, I beseech you on behalf of all people everywhere to remain steadfast, determined, and tenacious, and may God be with you, because the time is running out to save them. The time is running out to save all of us. Somebody wants to join our planet?